Well, good evening. This podium feels a little short <laughs> to me. Well, we have to adjust things to fit David. <laughs> if you would please look at the book of Second Thessalonians. Second Thessalonians chapter one. And I want us to begin reading at verse five. We'll read down to the tenth verse. Actually, let's begin with verse three. We ought always to give thanks to God for you, brothers, as is right, because your faith is growing abundantly, and the love of every one of you for one another is increasing. Therefore, we ourselves boast about you in the churches of God for your steadfastness and faith in all your persecutions and in the afflictions that you are enduring. This is evidence of the righteous judgment of God that you may be considered worthy of the kingdom of God for which you are also suffering. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his might when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed because our testimony to you was believed. Let's ask the Lord's blessing on his word tonight. Father in heaven, I, I know that there are many here tonight who uh, they're, they're here, Lord, because they love you. They're here because they desire to worship. They're here to receive from your word, but they're also physically weary and I just pray that Lord you would strengthen our bodies even now Lord that our hearts might be able to receive the things that you have for us from your word grant that we would be able to concentrate grant Lord that we would be able to uh, eagerly and uh, with energy receive the things we will hear tonight Lord we pray that your power would be evident both in the preaching of your word and in the reception of it so I ask that you would watch over my thoughts and my words that, Lord, I would be able to rightly divide your word and to deliver it in a way that would edify your people. Now, Lord, we don't think for a moment that any of us is strong enough in ourselves to benefit from Scripture. Apart from you teaching us, this would be a, a, a time of vanity. And so, Lord, we look to you for these things. We pray for anyone in our midst tonight who doesn't know you and our desires for their salvation. We thank you that you're saving souls in these days. We thank you, Lord, that you're gathering in your elect through faith in your son, Jesus. And I just pray that even tonight someone might hear the gospel and believe. And we ask for this in Jesus' name. Amen. What will the second coming of Christ mean? What will the return of Jesus Christ mean? to this world, to this earth, what will his second coming mean both to the people of God and to the world of lost humanity? What will it mean? But we are, we are meant to think about that. God wants us to think about that. He doesn't just want us to think about it. He wants us to live our lives in the light of that reality. He's told us that our Savior is coming again. He's told us the truth about the second coming of Christ, and he's done that so that we would know these things, believe these things, and live in the light of these things. One of the things I delight in, I think it's wonderful and important about the systematic study of God's Word. One of the great things about doing what we do, studying God's Word verse by verse through books of the Bible, is that the Bible produces its own balance. You know, if you just looked at a particular section and that's all you had and 
and you thought that that's all there was to a particular subject, you could get out of balance. You could, you could exaggerate certain things in your thinking. But, but the way what happens as you study God's Word is you see one passage and then you move over to another section of God's Word and you see another passage that tends to converge with this one. And, and what is produced is a, is a well-rounded view of things. God gives us enough information that we get a, a total picture of it. And our thinking is, is balanced out by it. I, I think about this tonight because just Sunday, we're talking about the need to love our enemies. We've been commanded by our Savior to love our enemies. And if all we had is what we saw there in Luke on Sunday, we might think, and we'd be thinking wrongly, but we might think that we could not in a legitimate way look forward to a day of judgment. That we could not, in a, in a legitimate way, look forward to a day when God will execute justice. When, in fact, faith in Christ will be vindicated. And the rejection of Christ will be punished. Now, I just want to ask you before we go much further tonight, is it right, as the people of God, that we should look forward to a day of justice? Is it, is it right, is there a place in our thinking, in our hearts, to delight in the thought that God's honor, His name, His truth, His Son, and the faith of all of His people, that this will be vindicated one day? Is it appropriate that we would think that way? What do you think? Absolutely. So we don't just have what we found Sunday in Luke, that we're to love our enemies and pray for our enemies and evangelize those who hate us for the sake of our faith in Christ, but also at the same time we're to remember that the Lord Jesus is coming again, and when he comes, he is bringing with him justice. In fact, these two things work together in this way. We are now able to love our enemies in a way that we would never be able to if we did not believe in the justice of God. Because the Lord has told us, vengeance is mine says the Lord. I will repay. You see, vengeance is not ours. It's not our job to repay. We love, we evangelize, we pray, and then one day we know the Lord will settle the accounts. Vengeance belongs to Him. What we have in the section we're studying here in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1 is we have truth about the second coming of Christ. We've looked at some of this already. In fact, we've, we've looked from verse 3 down to the first part of verse 7. Tonight we're going to pick it up in the middle of verse 7 and go down to verse 10. And we're going to be answering this evening some key questions, some important questions about the second coming of our Lord. And I say again, the Lord wants us to think about this. He wants us to remember these things. He wants us to be living our lives in the light of these things. So far, in verse 5, we saw the manifestations of God's judgment. Paul writes to them regarding their sufferings. He says, this is evidence of the righteous judgment of God. The fact that, we, that, the, that believers suffer persecution right now, it's evidence of a future just judgment of God. Because what is being manifested right now in the present age through persecution, what's being manifested is the reality of two kingdoms and two families. And the Lord loves his people, and the Lord will, will answer those who persecute and mistreat his people. So the suffering of his people now is a, a reminder that there's a day coming when the Lord will settle these accounts. And so we, we talked about that. And then we saw the equity of the judgment of God, the equity of God's judgment in verses 6 and 7. Since indeed God considers it just to repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. When the Lord comes, there's going to be equity. Those who afflict his people will be afflicted. Those who are being afflicted will be granted relief. And we can be certain of the fact that this is going to happen because it is right in the sight of God to do so. Verse 6, since indeed God considers it just or righteous or right to repay with affliction those who afflict you and to grant relief to you who are afflicted. This is God's plan. This is what he has determined to be right. So we know he's going to do it. 
Now tonight what we're going to focus on, beginning in the middle of verse 7 down to the 10th verse, is the nature of this judgment, the nature of God's judgment. We've seen the manifestation of it, the equity of it. Now we're going to talk about the nature of it. And as I said, there are some key questions we're going to answer. And I'll just put it to you in, in that format. We're just going to ask some questions and answer some questions. And the first question we're going to answer tonight is this. When we think about the, the future judgment that's going to be brought with Christ when he returns, the, the first question is, what will that be? What will that be? And we're told in, in the middle of verse 7 what it will be. Notice, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven. What this judgment will be is an uncovering. It is going to be a disclosure. It is going to be a revelation. Literally, it is at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ, or you could even say in the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. There's the little Greek preposition, in in the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ or at the revelation of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see, this judgment is going to be an unveiling, an, an apocalypse, a revelation of Jesus. God is not just telling us when it's going to happen. He's telling us what it's going to be. It's going to be the revelation of His Son. Right now, there's a sense in which the Lord Jesus is concealed he has not been unveiled in the sense that he will be on this day. In fact, it's interesting, this, this word um, in verse 7, translated revealed, uh, this particular word is, is usually used when the emphasis on the return of Christ has to do with judgment upon lost humanity. When the emphasis is, is on believers, the, the word is usually parousia or, or presence. But this unveiling, this revelation has to do with the fact that Christ is coming in judgment. That seems to be the emphasis. So right now the world is ignorant of who Jesus is in a way in which they are culpable. They're guilty. You see, it's not they don't know who Jesus is because God hasn't told us anything about him. Oh, they willfully reject the truth that's been given about Christ, willfully ignore the truth that's been revealed about Christ, willfully turn a blind eye to who he is, pretend that he's not what the Bible says about him. And right now, of course, the world can't see him, but on that day, he will be seen. And he will be revealed as the King of kings and the Lord of lords and the judge. Leon Morris said it well when he said, It is not only that the retribution will take place when Christ is revealed, the retribution is itself part of the revelation. You want to know who Jesus is? Well, when he brings justice, you'll know something about him. So what is this? Well, it's, it's an unveiling, it's a revelation. Where's Jesus coming from, according to verse 7? Well, he's being revealed from heaven. This is where he is right now. He is seated in victory. He's at the right hand of God. He is the victorious king, and it's from heaven that he's going to be coming. His coming will be personal. This is the same Jesus who was taken up into the clouds from the earth. This same Jesus is coming again. It will be a personal return. His coming will be visible. He will be seen. Every eye will see him. He'll be seen. You won't have to say, someone will not have to say to you, hey, I heard he's over there. No, you'll, you'll know that he's come. His return will be visible. His coming will be glorious and powerful. His first coming was in weakness. But when he comes again, he's coming in great strength and power. In fact, I think the word fury could be used for some of what will be witnessed on that day. In Acts chapter 1, verse 10, the Bible says, And while they were gazing into heaven, 
as he went, behold, two men stood by them in white robes and said, Men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus, who was taken up from you into heaven, will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So this revelation of Jesus is from heaven. He's coming from heaven. How is he going to come? We said in a way that's glorious and powerful. Notice what verse 7 says. With his mighty angels. And again, literally that reads, with angels of his might or with angels of his power. So you could take this as an attributive genitive. You could take this to mean powerful angels or mighty angels or you could take this to mean that these angels have to do with the power of Jesus and that's how I understand it because what's being revealed here is Jesus Jesus is being revealed in his power and so these angels will serve in a way that manifests that demonstrates the power of Christ the angels will, will serve as instruments of his power they will display his power and throughout all of this the deity of Jesus is being manifested both in the Old and New Testaments this is a, a pattern of theophany it involves angelic appearance when God is making himself known when he appears very oftentimes angels are also present and so here is the second person of the triune God. Here is God in human flesh being revealed from heaven. And with him are angels of his might, angels of his strength. And the activity of these angels will be, it will mean blessing for us. It will mean blessing for God's people. Matthew 24 verse 30 says, Then will, will appear in heaven, we sang about it a moment ago, Then will appear in heaven the sign of the Son of Man. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send out his angels with a loud trumpet call and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. So in the case of the elect of God, the activity of the angels of his might will mean blessing as they gather the elect from four corners of the earth. But the activity of these angels, in the case of unbelievers, will not mean blessing. It will mean powerful judgment. Matthew 13, 36 says, Then he left the crowds and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the weeds of the field. He answered, the one who sows the good seed is the son of man, the field is the world, and the good seed is the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one. And the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the close of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the close of the age. The Son of Man will send his angels. And by the way, that's a statement about his deity too, isn't it? Whose angels? His angels. The Son of Man will send his angels and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. What does the second coming mean? It means sweetness and it means bitterness. It means blessing and it means judgment. It is the revelation of Jesus from heaven with the angels of his power. The activity of those angels will mean both blessing and judgment. 
And notice that this is also described, first part of verse 8, in this way he's coming in flaming fire. Or fire of flame. Now this, this speaks of the consuming presence of God, the awesome presence of God. And, and when this fire is spoken about in Scripture, it's often seen in the context of judgment. Isaiah 66, 15, For behold, the Lord will come in fire, and His chariots like the whirlwind to render His anger with fury and His rebuke with flames of fire. So again, revelation, what's being emphasized? The judgment, the justice of God. Vengeance belongs to the Lord. God and Jesus is going to bring vengeance. He is Almighty God. So that's our first question. What will this mean? What will it be? It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. It's the unveiling of the Son of God. Second question, what will this mean for the lost? What will this mean for the lost? Look at verse 8. In flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. We learn about the nature of this punishment. What's it going to mean for the lost? It's going to mean punishment. What's the nature of this punishment? Well, it's vengeance. The word just means retribution or vindication. What's being stressed is the fact that this judgment will be an equitable one, as we've learned earlier. This is going to be justice. This is going to be what is right. This is going to be repayment. People are going to get what they deserve. This is not some indiscriminate judgment, just poured out, you know, sort of willy-nilly, and whatever someone gets, they get. No, this is going to be vindication. This is going to be vengeance. This is going to be retribution. People will get a return on how they've lived. Romans chapter 2, verse 1 says, Therefore you have no excuse, O man, every one of you who judges... For in passing judgment on another, you condemn yourself because you, the judge, practice the very same things. We know that the judgment of God rightly falls on those who practice such things. Do you suppose, O oh man, you who judge those who practice such things and yet do them yourself, that you will escape the judgment of God? Or do you presume on the riches of His kindness and forbearance and patience not knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance. But because of your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself on the day of wrath when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience and well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good, the Jew first and also the Greek. I mean, the judgment is going to correspond to the life. Now, we know something, don't we? We know that we stand before the Lord, accepted, based not upon our own righteousness, but based upon the righteousness of another, based upon the righteousness of Christ. And that righteousness was given to us as a gift on the basis of faith. The, the moment was received by faith. We trusted in Christ. The Lord accounted it unto us as righteousness. And that's how we stand before Him, accepted. We get that. And, and it's right. 
that we emphasize that. That is the gospel. But listen, here's what is not often enough emphasized. Those who have been justified will be sanctified. And to imagine that you stand before the Lord accepted based upon this righteousness that has been given, justification, and that there is no corresponding work that is going on in your life now, which is referred to as sanctification, the thought that you stand before the Lord accepted but have no desire for Him in your living, that in fact your life is a, a, an habitual pattern of unrighteousness and love for sin and love for impurity and love for that which dishonors God, the thought that you really belong to the Lord when your life is telling the exact opposite story, that is a dream. And it's a bad dream. Because when Jesus is revealed, what is going to be revealed is there are many who called Him Lord who never were known by him. He didn't know them and they as a result didn't know him. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality he will give eternal life. Is that you? But to those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, is that you? There will be wrath and fury. There will be tribulation and distress for every human being who does evil, the Jew first and also the Greek, but glory and honor and peace for everyone who does good. For everyone who does good. Those who have been justified are being sanctified. There is not just imputed righteousness, but right now going on in the life is an imparted righteousness produced by the Spirit of God, produced as we live out of the gospel. So what is the nature of this punishment? It's retribution, it's vindication, it's repayment. Who are the objects of this punishment? Verse 8, inflaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those, and we have a twofold description, who do not know God, and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And in the Greek text there are two articles, and so it, it has led some to believe that you actually have two groups of people here. That you have those who do not know God, and they would take that to mean Gentiles, and those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, and they would take that to be Jewish unbelievers. I don't think that's right. I think what you have here is a, a parallelism, and so the second statement simply sort of fills out the first one. Because both Jews and Gentiles have been referred to in Scripture as those who don't know God. And both Jews and Gentiles who don't obey the gospel would certainly be included here. Now this is just a two-way description of an unbeliever. Someone who doesn't know the Lord. Someone who doesn't have fellowship with God. Someone who does not have a saving relationship to God. And by the way, it's, it's, it is an ignorance that man is, is guilty for. And not only guilty of not knowing God because he lost that knowledge through sin in Adam, but also guilty of not knowing God because he willfully suppresses the, the light that God has given concerning himself that every man has been exposed to. The light found in what God has made and the light found even in man himself. What does sinful man do with the light God has given concerning himself? Sinful man, Romans chapter 1, suppresses that light, suppresses that truth in unrighteousness. What can be known about God, he refuses to know. What can be known about God, he doesn't want to know. And even worse than that, then when presented with the gospel, then when presented with clear 
good news about how his sins may be forgiven and how he may be brought to God and, and brought into fellowship with Christ. When he receives that good news, he does not obey it. He refuses to repent of his sins. He refuses to embrace the Son of God. He refuses to see and to believe in Jesus as the Lord who saves. These will be the ones who meet with Christ in flaming fire. These will be the ones who experience the inflicted vengeance. Notice what this punishment will consist of. What is the essence of this punishment? Verse 9, they will suffer the punishment of eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. By the way, when it says they will suffer the punishment, it is literally they will suffer a just punishment. The word decay is in there. It's, it's a just punishment they will suffer. It is an everlasting punishment. Eternal ruin is what the Greek text says. Ruin that is eternal. Ruin that is everlasting. Everlasting ruin. And this will be justice. This will be just. The just punishment of everlasting destruction. And the word doesn't mean annihilation. If the reward is a, an everlasting and conscious one, then the ruin is an everlasting and conscious one. And what it's going to consist of, what is the essence of it, is found in the next statement, from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. It is being barred from the presence of God. It is to exist forever in a place of banishment, a place of darkness. You see, when he says, away from the glory of his might, this is the manifestation of the glorious presence of God, which the righteous, the saved, the redeemed, the grace, this is what will enjoy the glorious manifestation of God's presence, but not these people away from that presence, away from the glory of His might. A place of darkness, a place of aloneness. And the worst part of all, perhaps, is a place of hopelessness. No hope. Do you meditate on that often? that hell is a place of no hope? Are you in touch with how, how often we feed off of hope? Right? Someone loses his job or her job and what, what, what do we say? Well, hang in there, something will come open, right? You don't feel well, but maybe even you get a, a, a bad sentence from a doctor. But you might recover. The Lord might choose to heal you. Hope. But without question, hell will be a place where there is no hope. No hope of rescue. No hope of redemption. No next opportunity. It's forever. It is just. It is everlasting ruin. The loss of everything that makes life worth living. And you are barred from the glorious presence of God forever. Then he says this, if there is any truth in Scripture at all, this is true that those who stubbornly refuse to submit to the gospel and to love and obey Jesus Christ incur at the last advent 
an infinite and irreparable loss. They pass into a night on which no morning dawns. A night with no morning. A night with no sunrise. No hope. What will this day mean, though, for God's people? We think about the second coming of Christ, and we think not only about the vindication of the Lord and His truth and His people, in the sense of the punishment and the affliction of those who have afflicted the church, but here's something else we're to think about. Verse 10, when He comes on that day, when Jesus comes on that day, to be glorified in his saints and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Because our testimony to you was believed. What is this day going to mean with respect to God's people? It's going to mean a day when God's people, when Christ's people are to his glory. You see in verse 10, when he comes on that day to be glorified in his saints. And I take that to mean just that, in his saints. Not just among his saints. Not just, not just as though we're the audience and he's standing in the midst of us. Not just by his saints. He's here on the earth and we're all praising him. And not just through his saints as he makes use of us. But he will be glorified in his saints. Because we will share his glory. We will have a glorious new physical nature that matches the glorious new spiritual nature. We will be like him. We will share in his likeness. And on display will be the masterpiece of Christ, which is His church. To His glory will be this people who have been rescued from everlasting ruin. Objects of the grace of God, deserving none of it, but explained simply, solely, by the undeserved love of God. He'll be glorified in His saints. It's going to be a day when he will be praised by us. It says, and to be marveled at among all who have believed. Now this is in the midst of his people, and what's going to be true on that day is we are all going to be blown away by our Savior. We're going to be marveling at him. Folks, don't you long to have a taste of heaven right now? Should we not marvel at him now? Should we not magnify him now? Should we not look at him now? Should we not recognize who he is from the revelation of God's word now? Please, please don't be deceived into thinking that you're going to find great joy in that day in a vision that you have no desire for in this day. We're going to marvel at him. But then he says something that's just a great way to end this section. Look at what he says in this verse. He says, because our testimony to you was believed. And I think to complete really his thought here, to really get a hold of his thought, you could, you, you could, you could, you could add this sort of thinking. And therefore you... That is, he's going to be marveled at among all who have believed, and therefore you, church at Thessalonica, because our testimony to you was believed. He adds this last statement to say, I'm talking about you too. He's going to be marveled at among all who have believed, and that means you. Because when we were with you and we shared the gospel with you and we told you about Jesus, you believed it. You are believers. And therefore, this means you. This is your future. 
And I say to the church at Founders Baptist tonight, this means you. If you're a believer, this is your future. You will be to His glory. When on display will be you as a finished product. You will praise Him and marvel at Him because you have believed the good news concerning His Son. So let me close tonight by asking three personal questions. I'm talking to you. I'm not talking to the person behind you or in front of you or beside you. I'm talking to you just as I talk to me. And I want to ask you this. What will Christ's return mean for you? We've talked tonight about what his return will mean. But what will his return, if Christ returns tonight, what will that mean for you? Will it be sweetness or bitterness? Will it be blessing or will it be judgment? What will it mean for you? Or to ask it another way, what will Christ's return mean for your eternity? Because what I mean to emphasize now is the fact that whatever it means for you, it's going to mean that forever. There won't be another opportunity. If he returns tonight, your everlasting life or death is settled. It's done. What will Christ's return mean for you eternally? And then I want to ask you this, and this is the most searching of all. What does your present life say about your future? You say you're headed toward a kingdom of righteousness. So that means you love righteousness now, right? Right? You say you look forward to a day when you'll marvel at Jesus, and that means you love Jesus now, right? You want to see Him. You want to know Him through Scripture. You want to walk with Him, right? You want to please Him. You say you long for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven, which means you're putting away sin now, right? I mean, you long for a day when His will is going to be done perfectly. That means you want to do His will right now, don't you? You see, I just don't want you to be among those who are woken up when Jesus is revealed. And you discover that no matter what you are saying with your lips here on this earth, your life all along was telling the true story. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and not do what I say? Depart from me, you that work, what? Sin, iniquity. I never knew you. Let's pray together. Lord, we thank you for your grace and mercy and love that is known and found and enjoyed forever in your Son. We thank you that we do not sit here tonight in a hopeless state. That for anyone in this room who does not have everlasting life, the offer has been held out even tonight. That if they will hear your good news, that life is found in your Son. And if right now they will turn from their sins to embrace Jesus as Lord and God and King and Savior, that even now, any soul in this room can know everlasting life, not just a duration of life that is forever, but a quality of life, Lord, that is from you. That means knowing you and knowing your Son, that even tonight someone can enter into the fellowship of God. And I pray for anyone in this room who doesn't know you, that they would hear the command of the gospel to repent and to believe, and that they would obey the gospel and run to your Son by faith. I pray for us, your church, those who have already believed, Lord, I pray that we would love our enemies, knowing that we 
can do that, that we can entrust ourselves to you because vengeance belongs to you. And you will repay. And there will, be, will come a day, Lord, when your name will be vindicated and your son will be vindicated and your church will be vindicated and the things that we believe from your word will be vindicated. So, Lord, teach us now to love our enemies and to pray for them and to evangelize them and to absorb offense from them and to, to display the kindness and the grace that is yours. Lord, strengthen us to love this world with your love. And I pray that we would live our lives in light of our future. That we would look forward to the day when in us you will be glorified. And we will marvel at our Savior. Because this is true of all who have believed. And by your grace, Lord, we have believed. We thank you for this in Jesus' name.